But first tonight, the deal to release hostages has been delayed 24 hours, while naive schoolchildren skipped school to protest against Israel today. A lot of news tonight. Let's get stuck into it, starting with the hostages. The first of the 50 Israeli hostages, women and children, were supposed to be finally coming home just hours from now. Instead, their release has been delayed until Friday, with Hamas yet to sign the agreement. We warned last night that Hamas would try to delay this deal for as long as possible to extend the lull in fighting. For mothers and fathers separated from their children, who are still in the arms of terrorists, every minute apart counts. Every lost moment is precious. For this mother, Hadass, it's an anxious wait as both her children, aged 12 and 16, and her husband are being held hostage. I know that without this family, these children and father, without them, I lost my life. The families have no idea whether their loved ones will be chosen by Hamas for release. Each day, 12 people released in exchange for a ceasefire and a total of 150 Palestinian prisoners, criminals. Israeli soldiers, who will be the first point of contact for the 30 children and 20 women, have been given a manual on how to deal with the littlest of the kids. They've been told not to pick the children up without asking, to give them agency because they'll likely be so deeply traumatised. They've been told that if the child asks where their mum or dad is, the sol soldiers have been told not to answer them, in some cases because these children won't have parents to come home to. They'll be returning to a very different world, to the happy one that they left. It's truly heartbreaking. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu addressed the public today for the first time since his cabinet agreed to this hostage deal. He said he's told Mossad to target the heads of Hamas wherever they are in the world. And the Defence Minister, Yoav Gallant, added that Hamas leaders are living on borrowed time. Netanyahu says the decision to make a hostage deal was not an easy one often find myself in a position in which I need to make very difficult decisions between a hard choice and an even harder one. And that is the case with the release of the hostages. The effort to bring them all back home continues constantly. And at this point in time, we can achieve the release of babies and children, mothers and women. Today, on day 48 of this war, Netanyahu had earlier spoken to President Joe Biden to thank him for helping negotiate the hostage deal. But in the conversation, the US president also forcefully warned Israel against relocating Palestinians or redrawing the Gaza boundaries. Former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert said it is inevitable that Hamas will benefit from this pause in fighting, but that Israel had no choice but to take the deal. They can move their forces, they can move their headquarters into another place uh, without us possibly knowing it. But this is the only available deal. And there was no way that they couldn't take it. Back home, Anthony Albanese and Penny Wong have been under pressure today over their vetting process for 860 Palestinians in Gaza who've been granted visas since the October 7 terror attacks. We brought you the news last night that between October 7 and November 20th, nearly 900 Palestinians have been granted visas to come to Australia, even though they're not Australian citizens. The opposition says... There's no way detailed and rigorous security checks could have been done on 860 Palestinians in Gaza in a war zone in such a rushed time frame. There needs to be rigorous scrutiny of the granting of the visas to these people, in particular to make sure that all of the usual security checks and processes were followed and that no corners were cut and nothing was rushed in the granting of these visas. Because 860 visas in a six-week period 
in a conflict zone in which the Australian government has no presence on the ground is a very large number of visas in a very short period of time. And I am looking for reassurance from the government that no corners have been cut in granting of those visas. Can someone just lie? Yes, they can, Pete, and it is not uncommon for that to happen. Uh, people who uh, are connected to terrorist organisations who have committed crimes obviously don't have a motivation to disclose that in the uh, process. And so that's why our intelligence and security agencies, including ASIO, have quite robust approaches in how they test the propositions put forward and the information provided. They don't just accept it at face value, but they need time to do that. Duncan Lewis, the former Director General of ASIO, testified before a Senate committee in 2019 when he said that, you know, in cases like these, it can typically take months to do mm. that level of checking, to have that level of assurance. And obviously, we haven't had months to do that for, for these cases, and it's a very large number. So I, I want to be made sure that the Department of Home Affairs, that ASIO, that our agencies haven't been pressed, haven't been pushed to rush these through. So as you heard there, James Patterson, the Shadow Home Affairs Minister, says that the former boss of ASIO said that these type of security checks usually take months not days or weeks, months. Well, the Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, looked very uncomfortable when dealing with these questions today. Um, how do you ensure these people are aligned to Australian values and not anti-Semitic? Well, these are uh, not permanent visas. These are temporary visas. There are the same security checks that are in place for people, for Australians, that have been in place this regime for a long period of time. And Foreign Minister Penny Wong just kept repeating the same line that the usual checks have been put in place. But she failed to explain how these checks were conducted when Australia has no presence on the ground in Gaza. How could they have been finished so quickly? How have a few short weeks been enough time, though, to do proper security checks? Uh, because as James Patterson um, said on our program last hour, that Dennis Richardson said this could take months, not weeks. We take the advice of agencies, uh, and uh, the advice I have been given is that all appropriate security checks, character checks and identity checks have been undertaken. How can you be certain, though, that these people aren't linked with or sympathetic to Hamas? Because we have undertaken, the government and its agencies are undertaking appropriate security checks. So, again, she did multiple interviews this morning, but in not one interview has Penny Wong or Albanese or any other minister been able to explain how the security checks were conducted with 860 Palestinians in Gaza when Australia has no diplomatic presence on the ground. Now, I put questions into ASIO and Home Affairs today to ask them about what process they took and if they can guarantee Australians that they're not bringing into the country Hamas sympathisers. Home Affairs responded to say, if a visa applicant is assessed as posing a risk to the health, safety or good order of the Australian community, their visa may be considered for refusal and all visitors to Australia must meet the character requirements before granting a visa, regardless of country of origin. We asked Home Affairs questions that included, have you had adequate time to do the proper checks for these 860 people? How have you been able to interview them when Australia has no access to Gaza? Are you assured that they have no links to terror organisations? And can you guarantee the public that none of the 860 temporary visa holders have anti-Semitic attitudes that would further erode our social cohesion? So, as you can see, Home Affairs did not answer any of our questions, which are firmly in the public interest. And ASIO responded to say that they can't speak to the specifics of the process, they just contribute to the Department of Home Affairs process as required. We have every reason to be deeply concerned about this. This is a government that has shown itself to be weak on national security, that has let murderers, murderers rapists, child sex offenders loose into the community without any monitoring or proper protections. They didn't have a plan in place. So how can we check, how can we be sure that the checks have been done in this instance? The last thing we need is to potentially put our children and our community further at risk from anyone who's been at the very front line of this war. As I said last night, 
while many Palestinian civilians are innocent victims of Hamas. Others agree with the hatred and have been pictured celebrating terror attacks against Jewish people. We need to be reassured that Australia is not providing safe passage for Hamas terrorists or sympathisers. And again, these 860 people are not Australian citizens. This at a time when social cohesion is already at breaking point, anti-Semitism now an epidemic. And it looks like anti-Israel bias and anti-Semitism is going to be infiltrating our classrooms now too. Hundreds of students gathered at a rally in Melbourne today, they took to the streets to protest against Israel. This attack was not unprecedented. As Israel has been occupying Palestine for over 70 years, Australian state genocided Indigenous communities. The Indigenous and Palestinian struggle goes hand in hand. People frame this as a humanitarian crisis. It simply isn't true. This is murder in cold blood. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. The protesters, school students, blocked off major roads. As you heard, they chanted from the river to the sea, a clear anti-Semitic slogan calling for the annihilation of Israel, of the Jewish homeland. There were also Marxism signs and a Greens politician took part. Why would anyone want to divide school students like this? Why would anyone be looking to bring anti-Semitism and hatred of Israel into the classroom where Jewish students and supporters of Israel will surely now be targeted and bullied? It's unconscionable that organisers have encouraged this protest, that school students are going to go back to school tomorrow and Jewish students will feel even more unsafe. Anti-Defamation Commission Chair Devere Abramovich said this is clearly an exploitation of students. Uh, it's clear that all bets are off and these dirty and ugly tactics of weaponizing and exploiting children to promote a divisive and dangerous agenda cannot become the new normal in our nation. And the group who organised the rally, they're called School Students for Palestine, issued three demands. They want to end the war on Gaza immediately, note their language, end the war on Gaza. Well, actually, this was a war on Israel, a war that Israel never wanted, never asked for. They want Israel out of Gaza and the West Bank. They want to end military aid and support from Australia to Israel. I mean, and that's the other thing about these students. They're all so ill-informed. They don't know what they're talking about. The state government and the opposition in Victoria asked students to stay in school, but clearly a polite request from politicians was never going to work. The leaders needed to be stronger about this from the very start, to actually shut down a protest during school hours because it does create problems among our youth. It risks radicalising the young generation of Australians and puts Jewish children at even higher risk of attack. The Victorian government clearly didn't show enough leadership on this. Premier Jacinta Allen was slow to come out and condemn it and tell students firmly to stay in class. Watching the vision of the hundreds and hundreds of students who were there, it's very sad to see that these are the attitudes that are held by young Australians. And this comes as Bill Shorten's office was vandalised overnight for his support of Israel. And it follows pro-Palestinian protesters targeting Richard Miles, the Deputy Prime Minister's office, also Chris Minns, the Premier in New South Wales. Their tactics are deplorable. And now they're grooming a new generation to hate Jews. These protests risk indoctrinating children to hate Israel in a similar fashion to how Hamas terrorists brainwash Palestinian youths to believe Jews are the enemy.